just Palm Sunday to you. If you hear the fan rattling above me, that is because it is a typical New Mexico spring day. It is very windy. I was swept to the shed in this treacherous journey from the house all the way out here, and I was nearly swept away into oblivion. I'm exaggerating, yes, but you can probably hear the wind and hear how strong it is. That is, that is New Mexico for you. Springtime is, it seems like it's going to be a great season because it's warm and the flowers are blooming and the trees are putting on their buds, but you have that wind and it makes New Mexico in the springtime not as pleasant as it could be. Fall is actually the, the most pleasant season here for that reason because it does this, doesn't get as windy in the fall and it's usually very warm and pleasant, although you can get a sudden freeze in October. I came across a picture just the other day when I was looking through for, through my pictures for one specific image and I'm like, oh, yeah, it snowed uh, on October 27th, I think was the day, one year. <laughs> anyway, it, it's not completely outside the realm of possibility to get snow in the fall. So, but most of the time the fall is beautiful and even December can be really nice. Uh, it can be warm and pleasant and it's not as windy as the spring. <laughs> Yes, spring allergies are pretty terrible here because of the wind. And that's really all I want to dwell on the weather because what a boring, well, the weather really has a huge impact on our lives. I think that's why we, re we revert to the weather when we can't think of anything else to talk about because it, it impacts our daily life so much, especially when you live in a climate like this, that can change. You know, you can get up and it can be like winter here and then by noon it's, it's warm and sunny and then the wind kicks up and you go on your afternoon walk and you're being pushed along by the wind and you can't keep a hairstyle. I mean, don't even try. That's why my hair is just this long mess <laughs> because you can't have hairstyles in New Mexico. I mean, a lot of women try, but I think it's too difficult. I don't. So I don't even try. <laughs> just, just let it get all kind of mad and wavy on a good day, but mostly not. <laughs> yes, so if you are a, a fashion-oriented person who likes to have flawless hair and makeup, well, just be aware of the risks of living in New Mexico. And that's all, again, I have to say about that. I already said that like a minute ago. So that was all I had to say about the weather. And then I kept on going. I want to give some shameless self-promotion. I want um, to back my book, my book, Delivering Hope. It is a great book and the sequel is well on its way. I'm having a good time. It, both the books are comedies and that is the style. It's a murder mystery ghost stories with comedy and <laughs> kind of my favorite when you have supernatural elements plus plus a mystery and then comedy yeah i i don't think that i can write without at least having some comedy in my books because life is really not to be taken that seriously, at least in my opinion. There are things that you need to take seriously, don't get me wrong, but a lot of it, just no, just don't take it so seriously. Don't take yourself seriously. Don't take your, the, the things that happen because yeah, really, really bad, horrible things can happen, but the vast majority of life is just kind of boring, what, putting one foot in front of the other. And if you don't find humor in it, then, it gets really sad. Yeah. Anyway, so don't be sad. Buy my book. I will provide the link below and I will continue working on the sequel and hopefully it will be done by the end of 2024. That is unless something really terrible happens in the world, like, you know, massive war or flooding or death or disease that just, you know, prevents me from finishing my book, it's going to be done barring all of that. So you should buy the first one so that you can be ready to buy the second one. And I know you're going to love it because Roswell is a crazy place. And if you live in Roswell, you'll recognize Roswell in the books. 
And if you don't, you're, you'll get to know Roswell perhaps more than you ever wanted to. Um, kind of like with the interviews that I'm doing, you're going to get to know Roswell more than perhaps you ever wanted to. But the nice thing about my interviews is that people are always intriguing, and yes, people from Roswell are a special type of intriguing, but people and their stories just fascinate me. I guess that's why I'm a writer, because um, I, I went from really not understanding people very well to loving to observe and talk to them so I can understand them better. I, I think that was my problem with the world growing up was that I really just didn't understand people and this is why I was weird, awkward, and, and bullied in school. But once you step back and try to understand the way people operate, they're actually really fascinating and their stories are are also intriguing. Everybody has a story. Even the mean girl has a story. And speaking of shameless self-promotion, if you like my books, you know, you really should give me a rating, uh, at least, if not a review, because Amazon does this little thing that social media likes to do. They have their algorithms. And for some reason in Amazon's algorithm, it thinks that negative reviews are more genuine than positive reviews. So they give extra weight to negative reviews, even fake ones, even ones that you could probably prove were fake. They were, they were because you had an internet spat with somebody and that person decided that they were gonna go give you a negative review on your book because they can, and you don't even have to read a book to review it. And they'll give you that review and it comes from spitefulness of heart and not really even having read your book and they'll give that to you and that review will get more weight than the positive reviews because in their cynical world system, positive reviews are fake. Like nobody could possibly be positive. It's only fake, like, like positive reviews must have been purchased. And, and YouTube is actually the same way. On my last video, I actually had more interest in it than I have had with any other video. And I think that is because the person I interviewed has friends, you know, he's a musician. Why wouldn't I have friends? And it was a great interview too, I thought it was. And what, what I could tell from the, the viewership was that it was fairly high. I mean, I, I don't know what the average is across, I could go look that up. I don't know what the average is across all YouTube videos of how long people watch before maybe they have to go do something else, they get distracted or they get bored. For me, when I stop watching videos, it's usually not boredom. I mean, sometimes it's just the subject doesn't end up being something that I want or it's not what I expected. And so I stop. But a lot of times it's because, you know, I get a phone call or, uh, you know, just there are various reasons why I might stop watching a video and then <clears throat> and then when I restart, it turns, it becomes a whole nother view. So say I got 10 minutes in and then I start again. Um, so it becomes a new view. Anyway, all that being said is that because of the increased activity on my YouTube video that I don't normally have, they've slashed my views. They, they slashed the views on there by about 36% the last time I looked, which for somebody who, who has a hard time getting ahead and being seen and getting my work out there, that's huge. I mean, it could be soul crushing if I let it be, but I know what's going on. It's it's not even people doing that. It's the YouTube bots. They're seeing the unusual activity and they've determined that unusual activity means that I must be buying views or something. I'm not really sure exactly how they determine whether something is fake or not, but these were not fake views. I mean, unless somebody that I have no idea decided that they were gonna send their, their bots to watch my video, they weren't fake. And it's, it's extremely frustrating, but you can help me solve that problem by subscribing to this channel. You can subscribe to this channel, you can like my videos, you can comment, you can give me more engagement. That way YouTube thinks that I'm not like a complete loser and um, they maybe will stop knocking off 36% of my views. Gosh, that's so frustrating. It's like, it feels like when you're in the creative life, when you're writing books or you're a musician or what have you, an artist, a painter, I don't know. 
just whatever in the creative life and you're trying to get out there and you're trying to be seen and you're trying to sell your work and connect with other human beings it's like taking one step forward and two steps back that's what it feels like and that's what it feels like when when YouTube cuts my views like that in fact I mean I it started happening 48 hours ago that they cut my views by a third and then my views went up some yesterday I noticed by the end of the day and then today not only were all the views that I'd gotten the day before gone but more so it was like say I got uh, 20 views but they knocked my view count by 23 <laughs> so that is it is frustrating and there's nothing that I can really do about it except ask you to subscribe because it doesn't cost you anything. It would cost you to buy my book. It would not cost you to review my book after you've purchased it. And it won't cost you to subscribe to this channel because if you subscribe, you don't even necessarily have to watch any one video. If it doesn't look interesting to you, you can skip that video or you can watch it and you can watch the part that's intriguing to you and you can stop when it gets boring. I mean, it really costs you nothing and it's helpful to content creators to support them by doing very little tiny things like that. Little things like just hitting the like button, just giving that engagement. That helps content creators a lot. So if you are interested in my Roswell interviews that I'm going to continue doing, I've got a bunch of feelers out. I don't know who my next interview will be, but I have had multiple people say yes but I don't have any fixed date yet so <laughs> until I have a fixed date I don't know who's going to, to be my next interview but if you like the the interviews if you like to hear people's stories and you like um, my weird awkwardness when I uh, interview them then <laughs> and this is the channel for you you should hit that subscribe button yes you should and especially if you happen to be Catholic and like Catholic um, content or you happen to like accordion or <laughs> prayer to mysteries <laughs> really I think Roswell is the uh, sort of binding factor for all of my weird interests uh, <laughs> and Roswell is kind of a weird you know what is funny about Roswell is that everybody has a ghost story here everybody's seen ghosts this town is so haunted I have never lived in a place that was as haunted as Roswell New Mexico and that is I guess why I had to write ghost stories set in Roswell New Mexico yeah and my books have are very um, Christian and Catholic uh, or Catholic Christian however you want to say that and, and so I'm not going for horror for the just for the sake of horror and in fact my books are comedies so I think you're gonna like them and um, yeah <laughs> so nostalgia that's what my that's what the theme of this vlog was going to be because when I was interviewing uh, the accordion player the other day a really I got hit by nostalgia and in fact I did while I was interviewing him and my brain even sort of slipped out for a moment and I had to like rein it back and bring it back. And the first thing, of course, was that um, we were sitting on the patio at Tacaria Jalisco. And when I first moved to Roswell, I lived in these yucky, shabby apartments that were in the same neighborhood as Tacaria Jalisco. And so that was kind of our neighborhood restaurant and we didn't have a lot of money, but sometimes we would go there and I have some really good memories, especially with my um, daughter who, oh gosh, she is like, she's graduated from college. She's on her way to getting married and buying her first house soon. And so that is part of the nostalgia right there is I remember taking her out to lunch at Tacaria Jalisco and eating their little mini tacos don't remember what kind you know I mean I probably ordered every kind at some point you know barbacoa or the little steak I don't know, and just whatever um I liked their food they were the neighborhood restaurant and I have all this nostalgia associated with that restaurant for that reason because that was the neighborhood restaurant 
And I also have some more recent nostalgia because yeah, you can have nostalgia for like different epics of your life that you don't have to go all the way back to your childhood to have that. And one moment that I had that I, I just have just stuck in my head was after my accident that destroyed my accordion in my car, going to the car lot and trying to find a vehicle was nearly impossible due to the post COVID problem of, of having cars on the lot. I mean, there was nothing there and that nothing that was there cost more than the insurance check that I had. And, and who wants to go into debt? You know, you, you just want to use that check just to buy a new vehicle, but you can't because there's really nothing. And, um, that I don't know what it's like now because I don't go buy cars very often, but that's the way it was. And it was obnoxious, but I don't that like that whole weekend is a blur to me. Um, I was in pain. I was traumatized. I was like exhausted. I just wanted to lie down and just like crash and, and just sleep for a year. But I went, um, I had lunch at Taqueria Jalisco and so I have that memory fixed in my head because I had their carnitas and I swear to you that their carnitas helped me heal from my traffic accident. I think that probably <laughs> anything with enough cholesterol and protein will help your body heal because um, cholesterol actually does heal you on a cellular, cellular level. You have to have cholesterol in order to heal your cells. Of course, if you have too much, then your cells harden. So, I mean, that's another topic altogether, but I think it's actually trauma that raises your cholesterol and um, because you need that in order to heal. So if you're constantly stressed and traumatized or you're traumatizing your body by like having a... <laughs> a 12 pack of, of soda habit a day, then your body probably is going, your cholesterol and triglycerides and all of that's gonna go up. I'm, I'm not a doctor and I'm not a scientist, obviously, because any doctor and scientist is like, what the hell is she even talking about? I don't know. But I I do swear by the carnitas at at Taqueria Jalisco. I, they healed me, in my opinion, I felt like I was normal again, could could function again, my brain was working again. All of that happened just from their carnitas. And now, <laughs> they are really good. Have you ever been to those Mexican restaurants where you order carnitas and you get like these lean chunks of pork with um, sauteed vegetables or whatever? Yeah, no, no. In order to have really healing carnitas, they have to be like, Monteca, like saturated in Monteca. Yeah, and that's the best. And yes, those are good. Those are the authentic, really good carnitas. And by the way, after that interview, I ordered some and took it home, but it was so late by that time and I wasn't really traumatized. So it was really heavy and I was awake all night because I had eaten such a heavy dinner. So I don't always recommend eating food that heavy, but yes, it, it it is very helpful to your health at certain times. And it's kind of comfort food because if you've um, eaten them enough and had food like that enough in your life, it just becomes comfort food, especially with beans. I grew up eating beans. So like you got the beans and, and the rice with it. Yeah, I grew up eating that kind of food. And so, yeah comfort food and very healing. And speaking of, the daughter that I'm talking about that I have special memories of going to lunch with at Taqueria Jalisco, when she left home and it was kind of sudden because I thought she was gonna be here for the entire summer and then she ended up leaving early, but um, looking forward to her leaving suddenly and then after that, I really didn't sleep for like a month and a half. I slept like for 45 minutes a day and I was like just like downing bottles of wine I guess because I was trying to deal with my emotional problems with my daughter leaving and um, or just trying to relax because I wasn't sleeping. I don't know. But you tell me which would be better eating a nice plate of carnitas or drinking a bottle of wine a day because I know which one gives me a hangover and an acid stomach and which one doesn't. So yeah. 
uh, you decide, but I, I think Carnitas would have been a better option than that, and maybe like just, you know, just collapsing and just crying and crying because crying is good for you. And there's a reason why God gave us tears because it helps us to get over our life changes and our life traumas and when we grieve. And I know that when a child leaves, it's a positive. They're becoming independent. They're moving on their life. But that doesn't mean that mothers don't grieve because mothers really do. And they should be allowed to weep when their children leave. That is my opinion. And also I think that, you know, the culture that I come from is really into suppressing emotions. But I think that being an emotional person and crying is just a right of being female. So I think that I should just be allowed that in general. So a good cry and a plate of carnitas would be the best option and just skip the wine. I mean, yeah, I'm not anti-alcohol, but I've just drank too much alcohol in my life. And so I just... It's a hard call to drink it now. I don't even most of the time want to, although I do occasionally. Yeah, but just when you can't sleep and you suppress your emotions, what else are you going to do but like drink alcohol? Probably not the best option. Prayer. Prayer is good. Prayer is always good. And that gets me into another area of nostalgia and I'm just I just want to close my eyes and just go back to a certain time in my life I mean no never go back never go back you should always move forward you should not stagnate the past was so long ago um, create new areas of interest, create new content, write new books, whatever it is that you do, don't stagnate. Don't always dwell on the past. But there are such nice memories from the past that you might like to think of. And of course, they always come with negative memories too. They say that, you know, there's that saying that hindsight is 2020, and sometimes that means that uh, your 2020 vision is enhanced by um, special glasses so that you only see the positive. But I don't know that I only see the positive. It, it's kind of a mix of the positive and the negative and everything works together, right? And then that brings you to the point you're at in your life and that will continue on until you die because that is really the only time that, that you should stop you know, moving forward and exploring the world is when you're dead, and then you, I guess you can explore heaven. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to have mini mansions, right? There's supposed to be a new heaven and new earth, and anyway, yeah. <laughs> Getting back to this world and this time, looking back, when I first started listening to the Mexican channels that were coming out of Albuquerque, of course I was commuting to UNM at the time, and I didn't have a CD player in my car because it was a very old vehicle, it was an old Suburban, and that's what I was driving. Yes, it has Guzzler too, so it costs a lot of money to <laughs> drive it to um, Albuquerque, and I didn't have anything to play music on because it was like like an 82 or something like that. So it had a tape deck, but who had tapes in those days? I didn't have tapes any longer. But I would listen to the Mexican channels and I was studying Spanish. So that was, uh, I thought was a good thing to listen to music in Spanish. I thought it would help me learn Spanish. Of course, if it had been um, other styles of music, I probably wouldn't have continued listening, like Shakira or whatever else was popular at the time, just does not interest me at all. But that music really, like the sounds just caught my ears and just like trapped me. Like I couldn't, I just, other music just paled in comparison. I didn't want to listen to it anymore because it just wasn't as interesting. I mean, not that I never listened to other music, but it was the music that it was like I had finally reached what I had been searching for with music all my life because um, generally what the pop music stations were putting out I just wasn't 
it was just okay. Like occasionally I would like something, but you know, it was all a really hard call for me to listen to anything that um, pop stations were putting out. But um, just to be like a drama, a drama queen about it, like when I first like paid attention and, and was listening to the accordion, it was Romona Yala, and I was so blown away by the sounds that I just had this like extreme emotional reaction where I just could hardly breathe and I had to pull over the side of the road so I could really listen to the song and it was, was um, Rinconcito en el Cielo which um, now I can sort of play on the accordion. I can play it. I don't know if it sounds great, but, but I can play it more or less. <laughs> but I never thought that I, that I would play that song on the accordion. I never thought that I would have a accordion at the time. I was just blown away by the sounds and I'm like, this is just amazing. And so I just pulled over the side of the road and listened to it. But as I was listening to that music, I would I would listen for lyrics or the song title or even the, the band title if the DJ mentioned it, and then I'd go look it up. And um, and a lot of times, you know, the DJs don't. You know, the, some of those songs are just old classics, and why would they tell you it was? Because everybody who listens to that music already knows who these bands are. But um, I would look up, I, so I'd listen for lines in the songs, and then I'd put those in, in my search, in, and I would find the bands, and it, as it turned out with, in those original um, songs that I love so much, they turned out to be mostly Texan bands, and that's why I got really into Tejano to start with, as opposed to Norteño. Um, I mean, there's so much crossover, but uh, Tejano is its own special, you know, music because it's on one side of the border. That's how things. That's how things happen. That's how. That's how the music developed, and so I collected all these CDs um, of these these Tejano bands that I really liked, and I got really obsessed. And I was going to school at the time, so that's part of my excuse for why I was so obsessed. Um, so I started like researching the music, the history of the music, and I would write papers on it in Spanish or English, if I could get away with it for my Spanish or my English class, I would write these long research papers on Tejano, and that's why that whole interview just made me feel nostalgic because he was bringing up, I mean, those were the accordion players that you brought up are, are Tejano accordion players, and I, I learned all about these these um, accordion players because, well, and I actually looked for this book after the interview because I have this book that has sort of the history of Conjunto. I, I don't remember what it's called exactly, but it's all about the the Tejano, but it had, but the book title is like the history of Conjunto. I, I don't know. I don't remember. But anyway, at the time I read that book from cover to cover and it had all these glossy um, like images in the middle of the book where you could look at all the pictures of the, well, and some of them were black and white because some of these accordion players, you know, they, they were playing a long time ago. And, <laughs> and so I read that book from cover to cover and I wish I could find it. I looked everywhere for it, but I, I don't know. I don't know where it is in some bookshelf somewhere. I, I just don't have a clue. Uh, I'd like to come across it again and read it and um, discover all those old musicians I used to like. Anyway, so I, as if I could get away with it, I wrote a research paper on Tejano music and that inspired vacations in San Antonio. Uh, the first time we went to San Antonio, it was, late fall, it wasn't quite winter yet, it was late fall, and it was sort of misty and foggy, and we were taking this ride on a, one of the river boats down the river walk, and like emerged from the mist a little conjunto band, or I mean, I use that term loosely. To me, to me, conjunto, the word means, it's the same as the word conjoined in English, and that's really what it means when you're like combining elements of various types of music. So um, to me, uh, a conjunto band would be like where you would have the accordion with 
maybe uh, like in the early days they had those stand-up bases, and then of course the um, <clears throat> the bajo sexto, and then um, the saxophone was another element that was brought into the music. So that to me, that's what I mean when I use the term conjunto, and I don't know if I'm using it properly or not. So do, do please forgive me on that. I, I really don't have a background or a history in this music because if I were to listen to my culture, my cultural music, it would be bluegrass because my family are hillbillies. And by the way, there's a difference between hillbillies and rednecks and my family are definitely hillbillies. I've called my, I've called my people white trash before. And that's kind of a, a derogatory term, obviously. Not, not a very nice term. I saw that once too to somebody I was working with and I'm like yeah my this is the food of my white trash family and he's like well this is the food of my mojado family <laughs> like okay I yeah I understand it's it's derogatory whatever <sighs> yeah but I mean I, I think I can use that term I think I mean maybe the lily's a little bit nicer I guess I don't know Anyway, so I just felt really nostalgic after that interview and well, there's a reason why and Okay, so I got really obsessed with the music and Like I went to a conjunto festival and I went to San Antonio or we we as a family did um, I didn't go by myself <laughs> and um, and I collected CDs and I even collected a lot of the older music even though I didn't like it as much it is the history of the music though so so yeah this is like what I'm listening to now on the radio and the CDs that I'm collecting now with some of the modern bands like Grupo Control or Intocable or Los Palominos or um, what's that one that just came to Roswell <sighs> I can't think of what they're called right now. Anyway, um, a lot of these modern bands, well, the the, the music that they are playing now de developed over the whole course of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So, I mean, to really, to, to get to know the music, you have to listen to the older recordings. And some of the recordings that I purchased on CD, like compilations, were like really gritty sounding, like really bad recordings. But it, it was, it, they were what they were, you know, they were, they were gritty, they were old. And um, I enjoyed listening to them because it was part of the history of the music. And um, yeah, even though I would be more inclined to listen to the modern <coughs> variations of the music. And so, yes, I got really into doing any, any time I could get away with doing a project or a presentation on Tejano music, I would do that. And gosh, there was this one <laughs> class that I took, um, I think it was on like like the trials of Latin American women. And, and sometimes I would take classes to fulfill my degree that fit my schedule. And so I'm sure that Latin American women have many trials. So do women everywhere all over the world. And so do men, we all have trials. So yeah, I, I learned those were very specific trials of, of uh, Latin American women. And it really was, it was from like Mexico all the way down through South America. And so it was a pretty broad general class. Although we watched a lot of documentaries on, um, because there were a lot of women being murdered in Mexico. And I, that's probably still the case. I just don't, I'm not taking those classes and I'm not like reading the news all the time. But a lot of women were, were being like ritually slaughtered at that time. So we watched some documentaries on that. That was terrible, horrible, horrible. Um, anyway. But at the end of the semester, she decided that we could do a presentation on anything, any subject, any subject. She did not care. It just, you know, had to be in Spanish. It didn't really matter. And so <laughs> I'm like, really? Anything? Like, we could do it on anything? Well, yeah. And, and she said, just present it to me and I'll approve it or not. And so I decided that I would make a PowerPoint with, like, accordions and whatever, images like like that and then I played um into Cable's Sonidor Eterno because that's <laughs> that's my life I'm an eternal dreamer so I, I really um that that song is like 
it, it really is very descriptive of me. <laughs> Uh, eternal dreamer yes so I played that song and I had made this PowerPoint you know like old an old PowerPoint with like you know images sliding and you know bursting and all that <laughs> accordions and the like it was really dumb and I read a bunch of Spanish poems that I had written and I'm sure in the class thought I was crazy because I don't know how good my Spanish was. I still really like my, I don't know if I read that one particularly, but I still like my poem Oda El Acordeon when I, I wrote an uh, ode to accordions and accordion players. I should read it on this this vlog at some point. <laughs> it's really, it's really kind of dumb. But I mean, that's just what I write is always kind of a little bit goofy. So anyway, so um, yeah, I got really into the music, but then something happened and it started getting really boring to me. So like the Tejano really started having easy listening sounds. And I didn't like it anymore, so I stopped listening to a lot of Tejano, even bands like Intocable that I had loved from their early days that I started listening. Um, even bands like that, just like, oh my gosh, so easy listening, why? It's so boring, I was so bored. And I decided that all music had to be south of the border and I started listening to only music coming out of Mexico because <laughs> I like the sounds better and I got really into Banda and and um, from Sinaloa and um, like once you hear like those full brass bands and sometimes they'd have accordion but I mean it wasn't really necessary for the style of music and, and once you're like really tuned into that brass band like there's really nothing that's better than brass band <laughs> I'm sorry there really isn't I mean yes the accordion is great but the there's something about that brass band and the way they sing um, like my favorite singer probably of all time is El Coyote and he's he's a singer from Sinaloa and oh my goodness like he sings directly to my heart like I can't even explain it like if you were to swap somebody else doing his songs I'd be like no I don't like it anymore it was kind of like um, we went to a Journey concert last weekend and I really like the band Journey you know for non um, Tejano or Norteño music, I really like Journey, but I liked it when they had Steve Perry, and Steve Perry was one of those singers that can really get you right at the heart, and they have a a um, singer, and they've had a sing this singer for a while now, but he sings like almost spot on like Steve Perry, but he doesn't have Steve Perry's soul, and he doesn't have Steve Perry's heart, so he's technically like a master singer, but he's not Steve Perry, so even though the music is really great, and the songs are great um, the singer is himself he's not Steve Perry and you know there there's always that problem with mimicking other musicians is that you lose yourself and you lose your heart and your soul in the process I think I mean not not literally lose your heart and soul you know you're not necessarily giving it to the devil at the crossroads but <laughs> there is that element where where you're losing a bit of yourself if you're trying to be mimic other people too much anyway there is just no singer that i have ever liked as much as el coyote um, he's great so if you ever want to listen to a wonderful singer then maybe he wouldn't appeal to you i don't know but he definitely appeals to my heart and yeah, so that's why that entire interview made me nostalgic because it made me nostalgic for a time when the music was so exciting, the Tejano music was so exciting to me and I, I even traveled to go see it, you know, and, you know, I brought up in seeing Ramon Ayala live and I do have special memories of that too because I was really pregnant when I saw it. It was like, so that just goes to show how long ago it was, but okay, so... I was like nine months pregnant, so I like went to the concert. I graduated from with them, and then I gave birth to my child like in successive weekends. So one weekend I went to the concert, the next weekend I graduated, and then the next weekend I <laughs> gave birth to my son, <laughs> and I was exhausted. 
But I remember it. Like, it's really, really stuck in my head, just like seeing Flaco Jimenez. And I saw other accordion players playing at the Cajunda Festival, but Flaco Jimenez was what really resonated and, and got stuck in my head because it was just amazing watching this master accordion player, like, dancing on stage with his accordion. And he was not young. He's... Um, he must have been in his 60s, I would guess, or maybe even pushing 70. I don't know. I don't know how old he is right now. But I love some of those older um, accordion players. And just that whole interview got me back thinking about it. And yeah, I don't, I don't want to lose that. I don't want to. I want to go raid my old CD collection and listen to all those bands that I loved so much in the early days. And there are a lot of them. And that's really, I, I just, I wasn't really expecting that, you know, when I when talking about when I just went out on a limb and texted an accordion player. I just wasn't expecting that to really be hit that hard with sort of a nostalgia for a time in my life when I was really obsessed. I'm, I'm really a research-oriented person. I know I've said that I don't want to be that way and that, I really just want to be an airhead and that's true I do that's my life aspiration now but it's still how I approach the world so that's why I wrote all those research papers on the music and honestly I wish I could find that book because even if I never wanted to read the whole book from cover to cover again it had such great images in it and and like I can't even necessarily remember the names of all the accordion players but it had pictures of all of the classic Tejano accordion players. Anyway, definitely worth going and looking up again. And um, yeah, I mean, I recognized all the names when he was really off his favorites. I'm like, oh yeah, 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 I remember all those people. And just because um, I'm like listening to Edin Munoz now and, um, and uh, I, other, like Los Dos Cardinales, you know, some of these newer bands that I really like so much, and um, especially if they're from Mexico, right? The music just seems, sounds a little more exciting. I mean, even to this day, when I go, like I pull, pull up a Tejano station on my phone, and the, the sounds just are still playing a lot of that easy listening, and I, I don't really like it. But of course, there's so many decades that they're playing, that you might get about just about anything if you listen to a Tejano station. So I don't mean to put you off the music, it's just there was this time when it just hit this like almost a stereotype of itself where we're like, oh yeah, there's Tejano again. They're, they're just playing the same old sounds and same old songs. And I guess the same could be said for Norteño, you know. <laughs> it just, there it just seems to be a little bit more, um, I don't know, it's just a different style, although there's a lot of back and forth between the Norteño and Tejano. And of course, Bond is its own thing. And that has all the big brass band sounds that I love so much. And like the tuba, <laughs> I love the tuba. And any band that has, instead of the saxophone, plays the tuba um, instead. Yeah, love it. Love that. That's my favorite. Anyway, like Clibre Cicenta, you know. Which Ed Munoz used to be in Caliba de Cincuenta. So, yeah, so you got the tuba and you got the accordion player and, of course, the guitar too. But, and Bajo Sexto and all that. But uh, the lineup is um, just a little more, I don't know. I think Julio Alvarez calls it Norteño Banda. <laughs> Yeah, that's what that's what he calls that style where you're you're mixing in the brass instead of just having the saxophone, you're mixing in all that brass with the accordion and it's like okay, Banda. Yeah, that's that's what my ear wants now because I just need as much drama as I can get in life. I I like drama and I need more. Yeah. And with that, I think that I'm going to say goodbye. I think I've been talking long enough. It's been 45 minutes. I hope you have a rest, great rest of your Palm Sunday and maybe I'll go play the accordion. I don't know. I have so much to do, but maybe I'll play the accordion for a few minutes and post something here. Maybe I should post my theme song because that was the whole idea of playing my accordion on this vlog was to play my dumb theme song. The 
Abuelo de las, de Belulas. <laughs> that was my theme song. I was going to just keep playing it and and then just play it as it came to me and whatever that was, whatever dumb, like, little thing, that would be the theme song for the day. So maybe I'll go do that now. I just, um, when I'm sitting in this chair, I can't really play because it has these arms and that restricts the opening of the bellows. And so I will go somewhere else to play. All right. Have a great Palm Sunday.